Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you folks for a few minutes this morning about our good news from St. Luke's Gospel, about what is lost being found, and about God welcoming us home. I was born and raised in the town of Bath, Maine, on the coast of Maine. The sea is in my blood. And prior to going on active duty 20 years ago, uh, I served a parish in Rockland, Maine, for seven years, also on the coast of Maine. And Pam and the kids and I lived in the town of Friendship, Maine, which is the uh, home of Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> and Friendship is a small lobster and retiree village on the coast of Maine. So living in Friendship, I would sometimes help out a friend of mine on his lobster boat when his usual stern man, his hired man on his boat, was unavailable, which was usually code word for too much fun the evening before. <laughs> so any day, one day my friend Phil calls me about four in the morning and he needs help hauling 370 traps. He had 1,100 total traps and he would haul 370 on a three-day rotating basis, taking Sunday off for church and family. And one of the things that amazed me about Phil and the other lobstermen back home is that they know where each and every trap is located. And I mean they know where every single trap marked by a floating buoy on a large ocean surface is located. That's a lot of ocean to cover. My friend Phil would not allow one trap to get away. He would hunt for it and search for it until it is found. And in Maine, most lobsters are trapped within a, a three-mile range of the coast. So one day I'm out lobstering with Philip. It's a sunny day, but a, a cold day. We got started about 5.30 in the morning, and by now it's almost 3.30 in the afternoon. We were hauling the last of 370 traps for the day before putting in. But Philip could not locate one of his traps. He knew by instinct where he had set the trap and the buoy. So around and around and around we went. Philip was dogged, persistent, and determined. He was on a mission to do some fishing for his lost trap, which may or may not even have had lobsters in it. I was spent. I was chilled to the bone by sea and salt spray. My, it was cold and my back and feet were killing me. I stuck up herring, fish bait, and I wanted to say, Phil, can't you just forget the lost trap? I will pay you whatever you think those lobsters might be worth. But I could tell by the resolute look on his face that that would be pointless. He was focused. He was on a mission. He was going to seek and to search until he found that lost trap. And why is that? Why was that? Because that is who he is and what he does. And as it turns out, the lost trap was found and there was rejoicing by me. <laughs> Dear fellow sinner, sinners and saints, gathered a holy comforter near and online, God loves each of us and each of you as if there's only one of you. In our lesson from Luke this morning, we hear the story of the prodigal, the prodigal God. The wayward son is not the prodigal. God is the prodigal, giving and going beyond anything expected offering generous, extravagant, life-giving, and life-changing forgiveness, which is so radical that the entire community is changed. <clears throat> the entire community is changed because in the culture at that time, if the community had gotten to the son before the father, they had the right to kill him. They had the right to kill him because he had so disrespected his father by taking the inheritance before his father was even dead. But what happens? The Father, God, gets there first, offering mercy, grace, welcome, compassion, and reunion. That is who God is and what God does. God runs to the Son. God has a full heart. He embraces the lost child and sees him with eyes of love and compassion. Jesus tells us this parable so we will know what God and God's kingdom is like, so we will know the character in nature of God. Now in those days, the father had the power to make the son stay on the farm. God gives the child the space and the freedom to go 
to grow. In scripture, God is not a puppet master or micromanager. And even though the son tells the father, you are dead to me, he lets him go. We have free will to reject God. We are called in baptism to be people of light and life. We have minds and skills and consciences. We make choices and choices have consequences. We are free to use our gifts for God's glory, for serving God and others, or we can waste what God, God gives us. We are not robots. We have a God who loves us and trusts us enough to give us our freedom. Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, is and means freedom. Not freedom for all things, but freedom from all things. We are loosed from bondage. We don't need to be either child in the story, the one who runs away or the one who is scorekeeping. And we humans tend to play hide and seek with and from God. Both children hide from God in different ways, one by running, by one by being rigid. We can run or we can be rigid. In our brokenness, sometimes we are both. This season of Lent is the time to examine our lives before God and others and to confess those broken places and spaces, running back to going home as the one child or staying home in the arms of God as the other child is challenged to do. In this story, both children, all the children of God, need all the Father offers. We are called to humbly enjoy and appreciate all we have and all we are in this life as a gift. And one of the gifts for me that come from surviving war is the appreciation of simply being alive each day, every day, every moment, every, each breath is an alive day and an opportunity to be grateful. Take nothing for granted. Life is such a gift. We, has a, we have a God who has room for all. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Both children are lost in this parable. The church is and should be a hospital for the lost, for the stable, for the wayward, the beaten up and beaten down, the broken and the hurting, for the upright and the uptight, people like you and me. A church without room for the broken is a broken church. God is prodigal. God is wasteful and generous and lavish. God gives grace upon grace upon grace. If God is patient, and if God continually provides healing, welcome, second chances, and new beginnings, if God is intentional about that, if God does that for you and me, shouldn't the church be leading the way and doing that for others? If you're a follower of Jesus, don't tell me what you can't do and who you, who you won't serve and who you won't care for and love. Tell me what you can do and who you will serve and love and care for. This parable, the story, Jesus tells to make a point. He tells us what the kingdom of God is like, like a parent who patiently waits for us to come to our senses. For one of our, Pam and I have three children and one of our two sons, now married and graduated from college, uh, served four years in, in the army as a sergeant between high school and college. And after his training as a mental health specialist, he arrived at his duty station down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and he started to look for a local church to attend. He is a good-natured, good-looking young man. He's six foot five, clean cut, presents well. So one day he puts on a nice polo shirt, a pair of nice shorts and sandals because it gets hot in Louisiana. And he arrives at the church and the greeter who met him at the door looked him up and down and said, we don't dress like that here. Our son turned around and has not been back to church since. I have to believe that God's heart broke that day. I know that ours did. Why would any seeking, lost, or wandering child of God go back? I was blessed to be raised to come to faith in a warm, inviting Episcopal Church, Grace Episcopal Church in Bath, Maine. But I left the church for 15 years. And I have to believe that God rejoiced when I came back to faith. Others showed and led me the way. They didn't offer judgment or condemnation, but welcome, invitation, homecoming, and the hope of a reunion with God and others. One that we see as God gathers his people around this welcome table, where all have a place and a space. God is patient. 
the father watches and waits for all the children to come to their senses. Both come to the end of themselves, and then they're ready for God, because it's about God. <clears throat> this is where the story gets really good, because the father runs. This is the only time in the Bible where God runs. This is radical stuff. A father, which would have been a Jewish man in that culture, did not run in public. But this father, in an undignified show of emotion, pulls his abaya, his, his, his long traditional Middle Eastern uh, robe that men wore. He pulls his abaya between his legs. He exposes his legs and his ankles. He splits his legs, which is a symbol of splitting an inheritance, meaning that God has enough for all God's children. This parable upsets the apple cart of all the proper norms in an honor and shame culture of Jesus' day. God intercedes. God runs to the son and embraces him before the community can get to him and kill him. That means the father, that God is and has been patiently but expectantly watching and waiting and looking for the son to return, hoping against hope. God initiates the celebration and reunion. God is about life for all God's children. The church is called to be the place internally and externally which models and puts skin on God's overflow and grace, welcome, and judgment-free hospitality for all, and all means all. So when I arrive home at the end of the day and I go in the door, I say, God, help me be the person my dogs think I am. They get excited and throw themselves on the floor for belly rub. They're simply overjoyed because I'm home and a reunion takes place. I think God is like that. I picture God running and tackling the one child. The son starts to confess and the father says, let it go. You're home. That's all that matters. Let's celebrate. Bring the best robe. Get some shoes on your feet. Put a ring on. Let's kill the fatted calf. Here's where the story gets even more radical and mind-blowing. Because people in those days didn't have refrigeration, right? They killed the daily bread. They killed the right amount of meat they would need for any event, just enough. So to kill the fatted calf is to pull out all the stops for the entire community. This is a snapshot of the heavenly feast to come, which we celebrate at this table. The father, the prodigal God, is generous to both children and to the entire community. Maybe there's a wideness in God's mercy. Maybe God's grace is more inclusive and expansive than our own. So maybe God has room for people we don't. And I thank God for that. I thank God that God is not good at math. If God is above scorekeeping, shouldn't we be? Shouldn't the church of all places be? Now there's even more than meets the eye here. The blood from the fatted calf would be spilled in front of the doorway. That means when guests step over the threshold, the spilled blood was a sign that the past was dead. A new relationship, a new future has begun. The blood of the fatted calf is a sign of God's total and complete forgiveness and God's son, Jesus, dying on the cross, an instrument of torture used by the Romans. God defeats death by taking on death and being raised to life. The grave is empty. The father dies to himself and offers what neither child deserves. A new home, a new future, rest forever, forgiveness and life now and forever for all. Not because it's deserved. Is it fair? No. Does it make sense? No. It's about God. It's about grace. It's about love. I would share, close by sharing with you, with you that God loves the unworthy and the unrighteous as much as the worthy and the righteous. And I don't know how we decide who is which. But that is radical. That is countercultural. That is life changing. We are all lost. We are all wanderers in a far country on our own without God. We are saved by grace through faith. It's about God. It's about grace. God loves each of you as if there's only one of you and only one of your neighbor. God runs to us. God tackles us. God throws God's self on the ground, wiggling with joy like a puppy. And then heaven goes crazy. God's heart is full. God throws a party and holds a reunion where the past is a race, 
for those who stayed as well as those who strayed are welcomed and invited. God takes us by the hand. He welcomes you and me and all with a lavish, extravagant, slate-cleansing grace, cleansing grace, with mercy and love. All is made new. All is and will be made well. All is forgiving. Something new is happening here. God waits for us. God scans and searches the horizon for us. <clears throat> God waits, and then God runs to us day after day after day until we come home. That is good news. That is gospel. And that is what makes the embrace of grace so amazing. Amen? Amen.